Well, happy belated Thanksgiving. We have Thanksgiving weekend. We're still in technically, so uh, we're so thankful uh, for the ability to be able to meet again today, and, and hopefully you had a great uh, Thanksgiving day with uh, family and loved ones, however you celebrated that. But we're so glad for you to join us in person this morning or online, however it is you're here. And so we want to stand this morning, and you know, <clears throat> Sunday morning between Thanksgiving and Christmas, what do you sing, right? Uh, and so the, you never know what to sing. Is it too early for Christmas? Is it too, you know, whatever. So this morning, we're just singing some good old songs that just lift up the name of the Lord, and they're not quite Christmas songs, but we'll get to those next week. But anyway, here we are together Sunday morning, so let's lift our voices and sing together. The first song we'll sing is Because He Lives, Amen. to 
Father God, thank you so much for bringing us together here today. We have so much to be thankful for. Just sitting here and, and thinking about all the words that were spoken in, in the worship this morning, it just means so much to be here and allow all your people to come together, Lord. And as we get together with our family this, this holiday season, I just ask that you put it on our hearts to, to reach out to the ones in our family or our friends that might not know you, Lord. And, and just use that as an opportunity for us to show them uh, the, the true meaning of Christmas in the holiday season, Lord. You know the situations that we'll be in, and I just ask that we have the courage uh, to go out and, and tell them about you and show you and, and show them your glory, Lord. And be with each of the prayer requests uh, Pastor Phil mentioned. Be with the school. Uh, continue to be with the giving at this church. Um, and we pray for our nation, no matter who's leading it, Lord, we know that you put the right person in charge uh, to lead us, and we just pray for that. And we also pray for Pastor Phil as he delivers today's word, um, that it will open our eyes and enter our hearts, Lord, 
And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Letting go of every single dream I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I've tried to win this war, I confess my hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is, you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things, be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. trust in you you are my strength and comfort you are my steady hand you are my firm foundation the rock on which I stand your ways are always higher your plans are always good there's not a place where I'll go you've not already stood when you don't I'm needing you to move When you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through When you don't give the answers As I cry out to you I will trust, I will trust I will trust in you I will trust in you I will trust in you trust in you amen thank you Liv I love that song I will trust in you I like I like how it talks about um, you are my strength and comfort you are my steady hand you are my firm foundation the rock on which I stand and that's who the Lord is to those of us who know him as Savior. And I'm thankful that he is faithful and that we can trust him. We can trust him no matter what. Thanks, Liv, for sharing that. Okay, let's get our Bibles open this morning to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 today. And uh, we're not going to be in a series today. We'll start one next week for Christmas. Um, and despite what is going on, our theme, our our sermon series for the Christmas season is called Can't Stop Christmas. All right, that's going to be our theme. By the way, <clears throat> people have been trying to stop Christmas for centuries, okay? They've been trying to stop it one way or the other, and um, a virus is not going to stop Christmas. That doesn't mean that it's not going to stop some kinds of celebration, but you can't stop what we celebrate. Um, you can't stop that. And so we're going to look at that in the next three weeks can't stop Christmas. But today, we're, we're just going to talk about the way that Jesus did things. Now, before we get into that, I, wanted to add, I just wanted to just talk about Thanksgiving a little bit. And I hope that every, everyone was able to enjoy the day and enjoy the, the, the idea of the day. 
to be thankful uh, for what God has done for us, to be thankful to the Lord, to be thankful to God for his blessings. And, um, you know, at each gathering that we were able to be a part of, we ask, we just kind of went around the room and ask, you know, specifically, what is something that you're thankful for? And it was wonderful to hear the different things that people said uh, that they were uh, particularly thankful for. And I hope that you took some time in this Thanksgiving season to consider uh, how blessed you are and how good that God has been to you and that you took some time to thank him for that. Um, the holidays this year are just different. Um, I know I saw some posts of people uh, having lunch through, uh, you know, a, a, a screen. You know, they would have their computer set up and their family would have their computer set up and they're sitting at the table together, enjoying a meal, talking while they're eating. Some folks weren't able to gather. And so the holidays and, and probably Christmas gatherings are going to be similar. You know, some, some folks who aren't going to be able to get together. And it's just different this year. And um, it just, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes ever in any movie or television series. Very new. Remember when we watched The Chosen? You know what I'm talking about. When Jesus said, get used to different. Now, it wasn't Jesus. And Jesus never said those words in the Bible. Jonathan Rumi, the guy who plays Jesus, he said uh, to his disciple, get used to different. And I'm like, man, you know, they couldn't have been more prophetic of this year, right? Um, we've had to get used to different for sure. Um, but if there's one thing that we've learned this year, I think it's exciting that we get to live in a time where we get to see God do something new in an old-fashioned way. Now, let me say that again. I think it's exciting to live in a time where we get to see God do something new in an old-fashioned way. You see, there's nothing really new under the sun. And God is up to something. And what he's up to is what he's been up to for a long, long time. And that's making himself known and saving souls. And we get to be a part of a unique time uh, in, in that history. And if there's one thing we've learned in this season of weirdness, is that relationships, specifically personal relationships, are valuable. And we've learned that Putting time and energy into them is good use of our time and energy. And that we've learned that when we don't have those interactions and those connections, how difficult it is and how detrimental it really is to our soul. More time around the table we've experienced. I mean, it seems like a decade ago, but think back to when we were truly locked down, you know, and we were at every minute pretty much spending it with the people in our homes. But more time around the table, more time discussing life, more time getting to understand one another, figuring out the things that we love about each other and even the things that annoy us about each other, right? We found out some things when we sat around the table in the living room with the same people for a long period of time. But you know, it was a return to life together in a society that fragments and isolates. And isolation is not good for the human soul. It's not what God created us to be. You know, Jesus <clears throat> gave us his, uh, an illustration of this uh, his, his, with his life. Jesus was not some itinerant preacher who uh, would show up at a venue with a writer uh, that said, you know, uh, I need to have this and that and the other. And then when I come out on the stage, make sure the temperature is this way and the lighting is this way. And I will give my speech and then I will uh, go away. <clears throat> we remember, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember when uh, Elvis would perform and uh, the show would end. Every, the guy would come over the intercom and say, Elvis has left the building. so that the groupies wouldn't stick around and try to find him, okay? Jesus wasn't like that. He, he wasn't an itinerant preacher who showed up as the celebrity and everybody, you know, was like, oh, and then he just ran off somewhere. Jesus did life with people. Jesus was in the homes of those that he ministered to. Jesus modeled for us how to have meaningful, Christ-centered relationships and to make disciples. And this morning... 
we want to consider Jesus' model for ministry as something to adopt for ourselves. Today we're going to see how Jesus did his ministry. And we're going to be challenged to return to his model of ministry. This morning's title is this, How Jesus Did It. How Jesus Did It. And let's look at one passage here. Luke chapter 7 in the Bible gives us one example, just one, of many that we can read about, and I'm sure many we don't even know about, where Jesus ministered to people in their home. All right, Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36 is where we're going to start. Luke 7, 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner, this, uh, what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner." And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord that we're thankful for this morning. Let's pray together as we dive into today's thought. Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you for the music that has already stirred our hearts and souls. Lord, we thank you for your love for each and every person that's here today and each and every person that's watching. Father, and even those who don't yet know about you, we thank you for your love for each and every one. Lord, we thank you that you see all hearts and you know all hearts. And Lord, I pray that this morning you would look into my heart and the hearts of all of us as we consider the word today. Lord, that you will open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to what you have to say and allow us to just trust you and to be obedient to what you say. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us how to minister to others and to love others. And I pray that we would follow in your footsteps in this way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are here, and that's amazing. That just, that, you know, I just look up and there's a bottle of water there. That's, that's something else. Kind of like manna, you know. Anyway, thank you for whoever did that. Um, our passage we just read, we saw Jesus entering into the home of a Pharisee for a meal. Now, 
we know that in the New Testament, there's many examples where Jesus would enter into the homes of different kinds of people. He entered into the homes of Pharisees and had food with them. He would have a meal. If they invited Jesus, he came. He would also do that with publicans. As you know, publicans are tax collectors who were the hated of society. They were the worst of the worst. They were the people that, you know, an average Jew would want to spit on them if they walked past them. Uh, But Jesus, if he was invited, would enter their home and enjoy a meal with them. Jesus went into the homes of many types of people and, and had meals with all kinds of different folks. This is why some people, when they saw Jesus in these scenarios, they would say, he is a glutton and a wine bibber because he hung out with people in their homes, having meals, living everyday life with them. And so when they observed this about Jesus, it really took them back. And they were surprised that a prophet and even a man from God would be so down to earth, if you will, uh, and involved in people's lives. Jesus when he came to this Pharisee's house, he, be, he was invited to a meal. And in the middle of that meal, a woman with quite a reputation came into the house. We know that her reputation is, is that, well, it says that she's a sinner. But we may say a woman of ill repute. Whatever term you give it, everybody in the room knew that she was a known sinner in their neighborhood. Everybody knew it, and she came into the house. And she began to minister to Jesus and to worship him in a way that is really awkward and would make all of us uncomfortable. Jesus didn't squirm because he knew her heart. Now, I understand that you and I, we can't know each other's hearts. I understand that. And so we don't understand everybody's motives. But what we should learn from this is that we can't judge people's motives, okay? We cannot judge motives because we don't know people's hearts. But Jesus does know hearts, and Jesus can judge our motives and the motives of everyone else. And he knew this lady's heart, and he allowed her to continue in her worship because he understood where it was coming from. And this scene is one of many where Jesus is sharing a meal with people, and we get a snapshot into his ministry. He ate with publicans and sinners and disciples and Pharisees and even allowed really, really sinful women to worship him and touch him. And this morning, what we want to talk about, what I want to kind of open the door to, is I want to talk about getting back to the ministry that Jesus did, the model of ministry that Jesus gave to us. The advantage of the global pause is that it has allowed us to stop and review and see what Jesus did. And we want to return to Jesus' model of ministry and see how he ministered to those around us, around him. How, How did he minister to the people he encountered? And how should we? So the first thing we notice about Jesus, and and we have the example here of him in his house in this house and and ministering um, in someone's home, having a meal. Uh, Many things that Jesus taught in these home gatherings were were pretty profound. Um, The people that he met with, he would challenge their hearts. He would work through things with them. Lots of conversation took place. And, of course, a blessing to all of us, good food was eaten. It seems like every time. That's a blessing, right? And so Jesus had these times with these folks. And I know there's probably some questions about life groups, okay? And, And... I've not done that before personally, and probably many of us in the church have not done that before. And so what does that look like? Why, why are we doing that? Why is this something we're even considering? And I, I want to answer that question this morning by looking at what Jesus did. And life groups is not about following the latest trend. Okay, it's not. Here's why. Because trends are just that. They come and go. Okay. And so we're not interested in things that just come and go. We're interested in things that are solid, biblically based. Um, We're not just doing this because uh, other churches are doing it, okay? Uh, That's not why we're doing that. Because think about it. All the different churches are in all different areas with all different types of people. So we're not doing it because of that. We're going in this direction because I believe that God has led us in this direction. I believe what God is doing around the globe is taking everybody from being scattered and and corporate, if you will, saying, okay, 
those, those are, there's times and places for that, but, you know, real ministry, real life-to-life, heart-to-heart interaction is going to take place in a more intimate setting. And more opportunity to lead folks to Christ in this day and age will happen in that way. That's just, I believe that's where the Lord's leading us. And so as we, as we follow that, we see that Jesus gave us the blueprints for this, okay? There's not, I mean, I'm sure there are books that you could read that tell you exactly how to do this, but Jesus showed us exactly how to do this, okay? First thing we notice about Jesus, number one, is Jesus ministered to the masses, didn't he? He ministered to the masses. And we got a couple Bible verses we're going to show you for each of these. And the first one is Matthew 13, 2, where Jesus ministered to the masses. It says, And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So, so many people showed up to Jesus one day that he had to get in a boat and teach um, the people who were on the shore. It was kind of like an auditorium. They all sat there. He got in a boat and was on the platform, if you will, and taught all the masses, the multitudes, who showed up to hear him. In Matthew 15, 30, something similar. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So yeah, Jesus did minister to the masses. He, uh, people gathered around him, and he gave the word to them in great teaching sessions. One of those that we know and are very familiar with is the Sermon on the Mount, where he taught a sermon. There's other times when he would gather people, the feeding of the 5,000, and he would teach them the word. He would teach them why he came and what he came for. So sure, Jesus ministers to the masses, and that's why we have a Sunday morning gathering and a Sunday evening gathering. We have a corporate get-together so that we can all come together around the Word of God and worshiping Him and praising Him and, and all the different things that we do that aren't just tradition, like giving an offering and singing hymns and songs and spiritual songs and, 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 and going through the Word of God uh, you know, expository in an expository manner and studying and topically and fellowshipping with one another and taking the Lord's Supper and having baptisms. These are all things that we see in the Bible. And these are all ways that Jesus also ministered to people by ministering to the masses. That's why we do this. That's why we have corporate gathering, to come together, to be fed, to be equipped, to worship our Lord, and to go out as sent ones into the world. That's what our gatherings are for. And that's biblical. That's why we do this. That's why we continue to do it. So yes, Jesus ministered to the masses. Number two, Jesus lived with 12. He ministered to the masses, but he lived with 12. Matthew 26, 20. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the 12. That's one of, as you know, many examples of a verse like that where Jesus was together with the 12. He connected specifically individually with 12 people. That was his group, if you will. If you want to call it, that was Jesus' group, okay? He sat down with the 12. That was his crew that he did life with. He went places with them. Wherever Jesus went, they went with him. If he went into a home to eat, they went into that home to eat with him. When he healed people, they were there watching and attending. When he preached, they were here, they were listening. But we also see many examples where Jesus would take the twelve apart, maybe into a mountain, or maybe aside to another town, and he would minister to those twelve. Jesus lived life with the twelve. That's a model for us. Think about how hard it would be to try to minister even to 50 people on a regular basis. Really minister to them. I mean, be able to speak into their life and to have them speak into yours and to know them really well and for them to know you really well and to be able to challenge each other with the Word of God and to, to truly pray for each other in meaningful times of prayer where, where you, you, you know the prayer request of that person's heart because you've had conversation and, and you know the things that they are praying about and that they're really going to the Lord about and you can go to the Lord with them about. 
We, even with 50 people, that's difficult to do. And so Jesus knew this. He had 12. Jesus, in his high priestly par- prayer in John 17, says to, to the Father, uh, I have kept them all except one. Even one of them. Even one of the 12. Jesus knew, of course. But even one of the 12 wasn't really trusting and engaged. So when you get in a life group, there will be, I'm just kidding. Um, don't try to pick out who it is, you know. You'll be sitting around the table, whoever dips bread with me, you know, don't do that, okay. Um, but Jesus had 12 that he did life with, okay. And these were the people that he, what did he do? He ministered to them, he taught them, he mentored them. He showed them the way. He taught them how to get the message out. He showed them how to love people. And he, he was living life with them. I mean, think about this. These 12 men, everywhere Jesus slept, they were right there. Everywhere he ate, they were right there. When they would hang out in a boat, maybe fishing, they were all together. You see, it's, it's a model of Jesus's. It's a ministry of Jesus's that we look at here as having a group that you do life with. It's vital. It's important. It's helpful. It's good for our souls. And it's biblical. Now, this gathering, these life group gatherings, are more than just having a meal. <clears throat> After all, we can do that anywhere with anyone, can't we? It's more about having a meal. It's, it's about having a Bible-centered meeting or a Bible-centered gathering. Because, look, we all need this desperately, right? We need each other. We do. But we need the Word of God ministering to our hearts more than we need each other. We do. If Jesus isn't present, you know, it's just a gathering. When Jesus is there and we're centered around his word, he's working in our hearts. I mean, look at the times when the disciples, after Jesus ascended, look at the times that they were gathered and Jesus was in the midst. He was with them and things were taking place. Look at all the different gatherings in the book of Acts where they would be praying together and God's Spirit moved on them and and He allowed them to speak the word boldly. You see, these gatherings are biblical things and they're Bible-centered gatherings. They're Jesus-centric gatherings. They're gospel-centered things that when we come together, it's not just to share some delicious snacks. It's to get into God's Word. And these kind of gatherings, friends, you know what they're going to allow us to do? They're going to allow us to not just hear the Bible taught and go to the next thing. They're going to allow us to digest what we've just taken in. Sometimes on our schedule stuff, we go from one thing to the next, and we didn't really have time to let it sink in and let it affect our heart because we're moving on already. When we have a life gathering like Jesus did with his disciples, when you're sitting around a meal and you're talking about the Word of God and and something strikes your heart and you begin to discuss how God's using that in your life in that moment or how He is going to use that in your your life or how you struggle with this or that or how this is strengthening to you, this is digesting it now. We've moved beyond just gathering information. Now we're into the digestion mode. That's what's awesome about these things. There's time for questions. I wish I had a nickel for every time I finish a sermon or a Sunday school lesson and someone came to me privately and said, hey, when you were talking about that, did you ever consider this or did you think about that or, you know, I thought about this and I go, where were you, you know, an hour ago? You know, like it really spoke into it. I mean, man, Miss Ward was like awesome at that. You know, I should have taken her and like said, Miss Ward, here's my message for this Sunday. Can you tell me what I should say otherwise? You know, she was so good at that. But How many times, I wish I had a nickel for every time that happened. And it's something that I wish I could say, hey, everybody, sit back down. Brother so-and-so or Miss Ward has had brought this thought that I didn't think about, and this is something that's powerful. You see, in a meeting like this, we can do stuff like that. It's an opportunity for us all to minister together. By the way, when you look in the Word of God, hello, when you look in the Word of God and you see the gatherings of the churches, You read those letters that Paul wrote to the churches. You know what he kept telling them to do? Use their gifts. 
And that's very hard to do. When you have a gathering of 50 or 100 people, how can all 100 of them use their gifts to minister to each other? That's hard to do. But when I'm in a gathering of 8 or 12 or 15 or 20, you know, then that makes a little bit more sense. It's a little bit easier then to meet for us to minister to one another. These, these gatherings will allow a time for us to dig in. The third thing we notice about Jesus' ministry and the way that he did things. One, he ministered to the masses. Two, he had a life group. He did life with 12. Three, he was close with three of them. Three of the 12, Jesus had a very close relationship with. Here's a couple of examples. Matthew 17, 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. It's a transfiguration account. Mark 5, 37. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. That's when he was going to heal someone that only those three were allowed to be a part of. And then Mark 14, 33. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. That was when he was in the garden of Gethsemane. There were three people specifically that Jesus was close to. He did life with 12, but listen, he related to three very closely. And what our prayer is and what our hope is, is that in this day and age, where it's very difficult to get together, where it's very difficult to have you know, relationships like this, where our schedules are so crazy and wild and everybody's in 25 different directions, other than our corporate meetings, which are biblical and we will continue to do until Jesus comes, listen, it's important for us to have those we do life with and then those that we especially relate to. And our prayer is that in those groups of whatever, those life groups, that there will be people that you'll really start to connect with. And I understand. Let me just pause and say, I, I, I know this makes some of us squirm. And here's why. And this is just transparency, okay? This is, this is why it makes me squirm. It's because people are going to know me. <laughs> and that's, that can be uncomfortable. But here's the great thing about the family of God. Or the family of God. That even as we get to know each other and we're like, man, I, I, it surprises me about them. I didn't know that about them. Huh. We still love each other, right? And we're accountable. We can help each other. We can encourage each other. We can pray about things together. And I, listen, I am a man, and so I understand, guys, this is not a, you know, we're not going to sit around the table and sing kumbaya and hold hands. That's not what this is, okay? I've had several people say, Pastor, I'm, I'm just, I'm not a crybaby. I'm not either. I'm not doing this so that all the men in the church learn how to cry in a group. That's not what this is about, okay? This is, that is not me. I, that really, bleh, okay? That's not what these meetings are. You might have heard about that. You may have an idea that's what this is. But when I see Jesus doing life with his disciples, that's not what I see. I see actual accountability and challenging and getting to know one another and teaching and, and helping and and, and bringing conviction and, and, and being there for each other. I can't think of a more manly thing to do than to have another man in your life that you can pray with and go to and say, brother, you know, I'm struggling here in my family. Would you pray for this? Or, hey, have you been through anything like this? We, man, there's something about that. Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And we say amen to that verse, and we love that verse, but how many of us really do that? And this scenario will allow us to have a closeness within those groups, have some friends within the groups. While these are Bible-centered meetings with peripheral food, we will hopefully make some great friends. The fourth thing we notice about Jesus' ministry is then he poured into one. I mean, watch how Jesus did this. He ministered to the masses. He did life with 12. He related to three. He was close to three, but he poured into one. And you know who I'm talking about. John 13, 25. 
Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom. This is uh, 23. There was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Verse 24. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? You know how John referred to himself? He always referred to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. I'm sure the other disciples appreciated that, right? <laughs> Look at John 19, 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, remember Jesus is on the cross. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. We remember that Jesus turned over the care of his mother to John. And in the, in, the, in the masses, down to the twelve, down to the three, even Jesus had a very close relationship with one. A true friendship. One that he invested in. The iron sharpening iron. And you say, oh, Jesus didn't need to be sharpened. <clears throat> we understand that. But you know what Jesus felt the need to do after he left? He felt the need to take care of his mom. And did John help him meet that need? It sure seems like it. Isn't that interesting? Jesus had a one-on-one -on -one relationship that was very meaningful to him. And I hope we have people like that in our lives. You might call it your BFF. But someone that you love and you care for in the Lord. A, a friend in the, in the ministry that you can pray with and call on and bring a prayer request to that's maybe sensitive. Jesus had this kind of relationship. And, and maybe in, inside of our groups, we're going to find a, a good friend like this. But that's not where Jesus ended. Jesus didn't stop with just gathering with, with his group. He did something else that, is, as our prayer, will happen organically in life groups, and that is this. He empowered them to go. He didn't just spend three years with these guys just to teach them some things to keep to themselves and hang out in their neighborhoods, in their homes, in a spiritual quarantine, if you will. <laughs> he did this to empower them, to send them with the gospel, to send the light. Look at Matthew 28, 19 through 20. We know this one. Jesus said to them, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Jesus sent his disciples after their meeting to go and teach everybody else. Acts 1.8 But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus didn't just gather for the sake of gathering and teaching for them to be spiritually quarantined. He taught them all about himself so that he could send them to reach others. It's my prayer. <clears throat> small groups, that the life groups, whatever term you want to give them, home groups, connect groups, Acts 29 groups, there's a million names for them. Whatever you want to call them, it is our prayer that these will turn into a rescue mission. Because maybe you'll have a neighbor or a coworker, or even a family member who <clears throat> may be intimidated to come to a church gathering, but wouldn't be intimidated at all to come and meet some of your friends and have a meal with you. You know, this is a this is a outreach opportunity as much as it is an inreach opportunity. I I can think of scenarios in my life of people that I know who I could invite to something like a, a home group that probably wouldn't darken the door of a church building. And this is going to give us an opportunity to reach them. Uh, a less intimidating place to come and hear about Jesus. To see how he's working in the lives of the people that they're, they're with. But Jesus always empowered and sent them. He didn't just save them to sit. 
he, sent the, he saved them to go. I hope that this will be a, a natural thing that comes out of our groups. So let me give you an idea of a definition of what our life group studies are as we close. Life group Bible studies are designed for believers to learn God's word and to live life together. Knowing our brothers and sisters in Christ more personally makes us a stronger community. Putting a bond between us so when we go out into our own mission fields, we're confident that we're not alone. Our life groups go deeper into the Bible, seeking who God is and who we are in Christ. That's the whole idea here. Some people would call these Sunday school classes. We're just doing them on a different day and a time. It doesn't matter what we call them. It matters that we follow Jesus' example of ministry and getting back to the way that Jesus did things. You know, God is doing a new thing in an old-fashioned way, isn't he? There's nothing new under the sun. If we were to have, let's pretend that we could have an apostle here this morning. Let's just say it was John, since he was Jesus' best friend. And John was here this morning, and we said, John, we got this great idea. It's so new, and it's so cool. It's called life groups. And what we're going to do is we're going to have pockets of believers meet in their homes, or maybe meet at, the, at a building, and we're going we're gonna to have a meal, and we're going to study the Bible, and we think that this is going to be a way to reach people. Isn't that so cool? And he's going to say, you guys are about 2,000 years late to the game. <laughs> we, that's, we invented that, guys, okay? Nice try, you know. This is nothing new. It may be new to us. It may be a new way of doing something. But it's an old-fashioned way as far as Christianity goes. And so we're asking the Lord to revive us to strengthen us through this way. If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come, and Sandy's going to come and play for us this morning for a time of invitation. <clears throat> so I, you just did a whole sermon on life groups. Well, I did a whole sermon on how Jesus ministered to people and how that we want to model what Jesus did. And so... Whether your life group is in somebody's house, whether it meets here on a weeknight or on a Wednesday morning, right here in the auditorium. I already have a life group, by the way. My life group's at 11 o'clock on Wednesday mornings, and we, we have a great time. However you do it, whenever you meet, whenever you get together around the Word of God, think about what Jesus did. Think about the, the, the way that Jesus interacted with that group and how how relationships and friendships and accountability came out of those things and how they were saved and mentored to be sent. And when we consider giving ourselves to Jesus' model of ministry and, and truly involving ourselves the way that Jesus did, and to love one another, and to, to serve one another, and God has gifted every one of us with a gift, at least one. Every one of us has at least one gift that He has given us, and how we'll be able to maybe use that in these settings to minister to our brothers and sisters. I'm excited about God doing a new thing in an old-fashioned way. And so this morning, as, as the music plays, or just right where you're at, consider how you could be involved or, or how you will be involved and how the Lord might use what you, how He's gifted you to minister to someone else. Maybe you're here today or you're watching and, and you're not even sure you know Jesus as your Savior. And, and the church thing is kind of new to you and you're, tr you're trying to figure this all out. Well, the good news is, is that Jesus will save anybody who comes to him. He said, anybody who comes to me, I will in no wise, and he says, I will in no way cast them out. I won't turn them away. <clears throat> and friend, that's you. <clears throat> if you were to come to Jesus today, and say, Lord, would you save me? I know I'm a sinner, I, and I know I don't deserve salvation, and I, I believe, Jesus, that you died for my sins, and that you were buried and you rose from the dead. Would you save me? The Bible says he will not turn you away. He'll save your soul. Would you come to Jesus today and ask him to be your Savior? 
turn, repent from the way that you're trying to be saved, the things that you're trying to do to earn your salvation. Stop and turn to Jesus. Call on Him to save your soul. Would you do that this morning? Where are you in the Lord today in your relationship with Him? Has this season of thanks and the season of Christmas coming, is it allowing you to draw closer to Him? Talk to Him about these things. I'm going to pray, and after I pray, uh, we'll be finished this morning. Our Father, we thank You so much for this day that You've allowed us to join together and to consider Your Word, to be challenged with it. Lord, to kind of... Uh, peek behind the curtain a little bit and, and see how you did things and how you ministered to the people that you encountered. All the many ways. All the many people. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as your people to engage ourselves in serving others, however that looks. Lord, that we'll learn together, we'll grow together, we'll serve together for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the sake of lost souls around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, look, we're glad you came today. And uh, again, happy Thanksgiving. Back tonight at 5 o'clock uh, for our evening service. I hope you'll join us for that. And then, of course, uh, Wednesday morning at 11 as well for those of you who can be there for that. Also want to remind you again, if you're interested in being a host or a facilitator, this Wednesday night at 6.30, we'll be meeting here at the church to begin training for that, okay? Well, God bless you. Hopefully, we'll see you tonight. You are dismissed.